perspectives. As we embark on this journey of learning and reflection about food insecurity and eating disorders, it's important that we recognize the systemic manner in which some communities on the land that we call Canada have been impacted. First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples have often had their traditional methods of procuring food and their relationship with the land forcefully altered through the processes of settler colonization. The residential school system, for instance, aimed to sever these connections among children with exploitative processes and treaties that weren't upheld and they've created the conditions for poverty that many unfortunately still live in to this day. As of March, 2021, for instance, 58 boiling water advisories remain in 38 communities across the country, impacting these folks' ability to prepare with and engage with food. As a non-Indigenous settler myself, I see acknowledging these truths and actively working towards reconciliation as critical. And if you wanna learn more about the ways that you can take action, you can check out the links that Caitlin is gonna share in the chat. Um, they're from the First Nations Caring Society. One is seven free ways to make a difference, um, knowing that there are ways without money if folks um, have that as an issue to be able to do that. And there's also a child-friendly calls to action document if you're wanting to have conversations with people in your life um, around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. I often find the child-friendly version, regardless of your age, is a really nice way to explain things in common language. And so um, feel free to check those out at the end. My name is Ari Maharaj. I use he, him pronouns. And along with Caitlin Axelrod, who uses she, her pronouns at Sheena's Place, um, we're going to be your tech support and hosts for today. You'll notice that the chat is open to everyone. So if you have a tech question, please send a message to Caitlin or myself. Um, you can send it to us directly in the chat by hitting that select name feature. Um, if you have a more general question or comment for the panelists, feel free to send that to everyone through the general chat. Um, and if the chat becomes too distracting, just know that we may turn it off until the question and answer in case you see that change. Um, but we are gonna have hopefully the time to address some of your specific questions later on. It's a reminder too, to just stay on mute. Um, we really wanna make sure that we're highlighting and spotlighting the voices of our wonderful panelists here today. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Sheena's Place and Netix YouTube channels. And um, we'll make sure to have captions on there too for folks who um, require that or find it easier to um, engage with the material that way. We know that this webinar is also during lunch hour, so feel free to eat as you feel like you need to. Um, we're happy to have that happen. And I'm gonna pass it over to my friend, Caitlin, to talk about Sheena's Place. Hi, everyone. Uh, very briefly, I will provide an overview of what Sheena's Place does in case anyone is interested in learning more. So we are a community mental health charity that provides group-based support for people affected by eating disorders. We offer many different types of groups um, facilitated by professionals, and they are available to anyone in Ontario um, who is at least 17 years old. Um, all of our programs are free of charge and based on self-referral, so no eating disorder diagnosis is required um, to register. And um, please let me know in the chat. Feel free to send me a message if you have any questions, or feel free to email info at sheenasplace.org. I'll talk a little bit about Netic. We're a registered Canadian charity that's been helping people affected with, by eating disorders since 1985. Um, we operate a national toll-free telephone helpline and an online chat program that provides support, information, and referrals to people who are affected and those who care for them. Like Sheena's Place, you don't need a diagnosis to contact us. It's an anonymous and confidential service and anyone can reach out. So if it's a concern for you, it's a concern for us and please do. We also deliver prevention focused workshops to youth and facilitate professional development in person and online through our outreach and education program. So if you have questions about that, feel free to send a private message to me, Ari, or email netic at uhn.ca and we're happy to do that. We're gonna get started in a moment and um, this is gonna be a general conversation to say, um, there might be things in this conversation that might heighten your own mental health. And so please take care of yourself however you feel like you need to. This is being recorded partly for that reason. So if you need to log out or take a step away, get a drink of water, feel free to do that. Our panelists and our moderator have been asked to speak from the I perspective and to really not make assumptions about others' experiences. And they're also being asked to avoid going into detail about traumatic experiences or eating disorder details like specific numbers or details around symptoms. 
we ask that you keep these language guidelines in mind while asking for questions as we know that there um, are lots of people with us today at different places in their journey. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our moderator, John Choi. Um, John has worked in community mental health for over 25 years, um, early on as a therapist and then in various roles of management. He's currently the executive director at Sheena's Place. And so welcome, John. Thank you, Ari. And uh, I want to start by just acknowledging a, a great amount of gratitude for the privilege of being able to moderate uh, the discussion today. I'd like to thank everybody in attendance for taking the time to join us. Um, and thank you, Ari and Caitlin, for all the work that you did to put this, um, this event together. I'd also like to extend uh, some deep gratitude to each of our panelists uh, for agreeing to take part in the event. And uh, we're very excited and uh, looking forward to, to hearing from each of you. Um, we'll uh, jump right into the, um, to the discussion. And uh, I'll start by posing uh, questions to each of the panelists and, and ask each of you to briefly um, share a little bit about yourselves uh, for, the, for the audience as well. So Carolyn, if I could start with you. Um, the, the research has uh, established that uh, folks who experience food insecurity um, are far more likely to exhibit symptoms of eating disorders. Um, can you tell us why that's so? Hi, thank you for that question. Um, so let me just start by saying I am uh, Dr. Carolyn Becker. Everyone should feel free to call me Carolyn. Um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist um, here in San Antonio, Texas. Um, my day job is I'm a professor at a small college, um, Trinity University, um, and I specialize in eating disorders as well as a number of other um, clinical conditions. So I'm gonna actually back up just a little bit on this question um, and say, I think one of the main reasons I was invited to be on this panel is that my students and colleagues and I conducted some of the earliest um, sort of substantive research looking at food insecurity and eating disorders. And I realized that some of the people listening may be here sort of out of curiosity or maybe sort of wondering like, food insecurity and eating disorders, I didn't really think those things went together. And there's a really good reason why many people um, don't think those things go together. And in fact, when I first started doing this research, my colleagues actually often looked at me like I had two heads. They would say, you're doing what? You're studying food insecurity and eating disorders. Why would you do that? That seems really puzzling to us. And the reason it seemed really puzzling to many people is that um, it has been a long-standing, the very inaccurate stereotype that eating disorders are predominantly a problem for um, thin, uh, white, um, at least moderately affluent women and girls. Um, this is a stereotype that is um, endemic, unfortunately, in the eating disorders field. Um, as I said earlier, it is inaccurate. But as a result, it led people to be very surprised when I started doing research here in San Antonio, Texas, looking at impoverished individuals um, who were predominantly not white and predominantly not thin. I, San Antonio, you may not be familiar with, is a, a majority Hispanic city um, uh, with um, high immigrant population from Mexico. It's one of the great things about our city. Um, but many of the people who um, live in poverty are in fact um, Hispanic. Um, and so when we started looking at eating disorders and food insecurity, by definition, we were looking at populations that violated this stereotype that is held not just in the general public, but by clinicians and indeed by individuals who have eating disorders frequently will not recognize that they have eating disorders if they don't conform to the stereotype. So we started looking at this, um, at this question um, in part because of some teaching that I was doing and really just went into it asking the question, well, you know, do we see elevated rates of eating disorder pathology in people who are living with food insecurity? Um, and what our initial study, which was about 500 people found, was that those with the most severe form of food insecurity um, were actually at markedly elevated risk for developing an eating disorder. So they were much higher than community samples in eating disorders. Now, when I say at most elevated risk, I should really specify that where we found the greatest risk for the development of eating disorders, and this was in adults, I should say, it was not in children, was in those where people were really going hungry in the home. In the home. So we looked at eating disorder risk across the spectrum of food insecurity. We looked at people who were on the margins of food security and insecurity. We looked at people who 
were very anxious about getting their food. It was very unstable, but they reported that nobody was going hungry. We looked at people who reported that adults were going hungry in the home, but no children were going hungry. And then we looked at adults who reported that not only were they going hungry, but food was so restricted that their children were going hungry. And it is in this latter group that we found elevated rates of eating disorder pathology. And to clarify, that means we found elevated rates of binge eating. Um, we found elevated rates of binge eating at night. We found elevated rates of purging behaviors, uh, which really surprised a lot of people. And we found elevated rates of clinically significant eating disorders. Um, and this was really surprising to the field um, when this first came out. This was not a population that people had really thought to study. Um, we've since done subsequent research and validated that finding. We replicated that finding. Um, those of you who remember your science classes will remember replication is the heart of science. So we've found that in another sample. Um, um, and other researchers have now started looking at this much more closely. I'm really excited to say that since we published our first paper, this is like a burgeoning area of research in the eating disorders field. Um, and these findings are, you know, holding up relatively well, um, which is both good from a science perspective and very sad to me from a human perspective. Um, because what we're talking about are people who are very vulnerable in our society. If you don't have enough food to eat, then that really limits um, your ability to do um, many things. Um, and um, I, I don't think we fully know why this is. So let me just clarify that we're, we're at such early stages of this research, you know, we're only about four or five years in that I cannot definitively say why that is. What I can do is speculate. Um, we've known since the 1940s um, that dietary restriction um, can increase risk of an eating disorder in people who are susceptible. We think probably genetically susceptible. That research goes back to famous research by Ansel Keys. You may or may not be familiar with the Minnesota starvation study, which found that back in the 1940s. Um, so what I think is going on here is that people, particularly people who are so strapped for food, who are, are so food insecure that they are unable to keep their children from being hungry, um, are undergoing a particular type of dietary restriction that increases their risk for eating disorders. So that's what we think is going on. In addition, I should note that, you know, there is nothing about living in poverty that increases, that decreases your risk for mental illness. We know that poverty increases your risk for depression. It increases your risk for anxiety. It increases your risk for substance abuse. It increases your risk for all sorts of other problems because there's increased stress with poverty. Um, and um, it's kind of ironic that the eating disorder field sort of thought that poverty in a sense conferred some sort of benefit to people when it came to eating disorders. Um, I don't think anybody spelled that out, but that was sort of an implicit um, assumption that we weren't really looking at people who were financially constrained when it came to eating disorders. Um, but, you know, we're looking at people who, um, you know, have a lot of stress in their lives and have a lot of difficult things happening to them who are really struggling to put food on the table, to heat uh, their homes or cool their homes, to have electricity on. Um, I will finish just by saying that my students who did this research with me would come back um, to our university campus, our a very um, well-funded university campus and say that for the first time in their lives, they felt lucky to be able to hit a light switch and turn their lights on, that for the first time in their lives, they felt lucky that there was food on their table. Um, so I think it's just really important that we start to broaden the lens of who we're looking at when we think about eating disorders. That's my initial. Thank you for that, Carolyn. It's, it's obviously very clear that the dynamics involved are, are extremely complex and that there is a really high need for ongoing additional research um, to help us get a further, clearer understanding of, uh, of what's going on. Um, but thank you for that initial uh, explanation and, and clarification. Um, Amber, if we can go to you and, and uh, I'll ask if you could um, share a brief uh, introduction of yourself and, and then um, share with us, how did food insecurity play a role in the development or, or maintenance of uh, eating disorder for you? Yeah, thank you so much, John. Um, my name is Amber Bent. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I live in Calgary, Alberta. Um, in school for my undergrad, I studied psychology and art, and uh, I am one year in of recovery from bulimia. So we've come a long way. 
Um, I'm going to give a brief sort of history of kind of what food insecurity looked like for me and then go into how I believe that that developed or maintained. And of course, my reasons for why I think that they developed, uh, it developed or maintained my eating disorder is just speculation. Um, like Carolyn said, this is very um, multifaceted. There could be many variables that contributed. So, um, so I grew up very poor and uh, in poverty and we, we actually experienced bankruptcy um, when I was in my teens. My parents didn't have a lot of money for food. So our fridge was always empty and we were often left to fend for ourselves. So this is, uh, there were four of us kids in the home. We were that family that received groceries from like the local church and neighbors and friends. And even my best friend's mom brought a van full of groceries to our house. I remember one time when I was a kid. Um, we often ate the same foods every day. Food was more of a burden than something to enjoy. So that really changed the tone of like what food was for me. Um, when people brought us food, the novelty of the food and its variety was exciting to us. And even if my parents went grocery shopping, um, all of us kids would just rush to the kitchen to see what they had brought home. And um, because we probably, we had been without food for several days at that point. And um, we, we would often binge that food, like within a day or two, all the cereal was gone and all the good things that, you know, had sugar that we enjoyed. Um, were gone very quickly. Um, and so there was a scarcity mindset that was sort of built into us, which led us to that overeating whenever there was an abundance of food. It was either a feast or a famine, um, which I personally think is very similar to that restrict binge cycle that people with eating disorders often get caught in. Um, there was also a history of eating disorders in my family. And so I was very aware of my weight, even as a child. And I watched members of my family struggle with their weight. And the conversation of weight loss and body size was very present in my home all the time. So all these experiences, like I said, set me up with a scarcity mindset for adulthood. And it skewed my relationship with food. Um, and I didn't know how to eat normally. So I didn't enjoy food. Food was a task and cooking was tiring and stressful. Under eating was very typical in my family. Meal skipping was typical and body size awareness was also prevalent. So when I moved out on my own, I sort of swung from famine to feast and um, I made sure my fridge was always overflowing with an abundance of food um, and, and bought all the things that I wanted to eat and a variety of food, which I hadn't really experienced as a kid. I liked to open my fridge door and see lots of food in it. And I often actually threw away food because there was too much for me to eat. Um, and so another contributing factor to this whole picture was that in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And um, it was suggested to me that I eliminated wheat from my diet. And that was my first restriction um, that I brought into my diet. And I also went to a dietitian who um, identified that I was actually under eating, which was a pattern in my upbringing. And so I had this preoccupation with my weight, which I had learned from my family and the disease caused my weight to be super inconsistent, which scared me. And that's when the eating disorder developed because I wanted to try to manage my weight because it was out of control from many factors. Um, I had added many food groups to my list of restrictions as a means to manage my disease, but the underlying motivation was that I wanted to manage my weight. And so these were a lot of the things that really um, led to my eating disorder. I was stuck in a restrict binge cycle, almost recreating that pattern of feast and famine that I grew up with because I was familiar with it. Um, by my early 30s, I had only a list of about 10 safe foods that I ate every single day. 
Um, in my adulthood, I also experienced food insecurity. So when I was in my mid 20s and in my early 30s during university, and I had to access the food bank locally here in Calgary, as well as through the university over these last five years. Um, my health often prevented me from working and that created a barrier for me to provide for myself. I also experienced food insecurity through the pandemic. Um, but thankfully in June of 2020, I decided to recover. I became aware that I had an eating disorder in 2017, ironically, when I was studying psychology in school. And in June, 2020, um, that's when I decided I was going to recover. And thankfully at that point, I was financially secure enough to provide myself with the food abundance that I needed to um, overcome that sort of feast famine mechanism. <clears throat> um, some of the behaviors that I noticed sort of resulted from this feast famine um, mechanism that was operating my, in my life was that after periods of having no money or little money for, mood, for food and having to have accessed food services or community services, the moment I got a little bit of money for food, I would overspend on food. Um, and so, but the restriction that I had in my diet um, created this preoccupation with food and resulted in food seeking behavior. I also had an energy deficit from all of the restriction, like years of restriction and under eating, which also led to a lot of food seeking behavior and storing behavior because I was literally hungry. Um, I really struggled to find a happy medium in between the two extremes of feast and famine. And so I think that the food insecurity contributed to my eating disorder because it quite literally mimicked an eating disorder. Restriction mimics famine and essentially you are gonna want what you can't have. And so restriction is actually a self-imposed famine. And like I said earlier, being in this famine or the self-imposed famine creates a preoccupation with food, which is like the hallmark of eating disorders. You are very preoccupied with food. <clears throat> One of the things that I remember during my period of having extreme hunger in my recovery process was having to remind myself, the food will always be there. <laughs> The pizza will always be there. The ice cream will always be there. Food will always be available because it was that, that fear of famine that drove me to that seeking be, food seeking behavior. Um, so now after a year of recovery, I, I feel like I'm beginning to find that middle ground in between the feast and the famine and finding some balance where I'm no longer under eating and I no longer have extreme hunger and I have the financial security to provide enough food for myself, which, is less to, which has led to less overspending on food. Um, yeah, and so that's basically what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for sharing, Amber. Um, I, it's so very clear that uh, in in our space, in our eating disorder space, that uh, we we benefit from, and I highly value the the contributions of the formal research and the perspectives of individuals with lived experience, and and it's um, it's so integral in, in continuing to for us to learn and, and understand, and particularly challenging to, to share personal experiences. So I'm very grateful for your contribution today. Thank you. Jade, if um, we can turn to you um, and uh, if you could share a brief inter introduction and, um, and, and maybe uh, sort of shine a light on the concept of food justice and how that differs from uh, the concept of food insecurity. And then maybe touch upon how different identities intersect with um, the, the concept of um, food justice and, and access to food? Sure, that's a big question. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Jade, uh, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Amber, for sharing your personal story. I really appreciate and feel really lucky to be here and to be able to have listened to you and heard that. Um, 
And yeah, I also wanted to like, I know this isn't the question you asked me, but I wanted to circle back to the first question that you did ask Carolyn, just to add in my two cents as not a researcher. <laughs> um, so I don't really know if I'm like posed to answer this or to like add anything insightful, but I was just thinking about the question. I think it's really interesting um, to look at those connections that you were talking about, Carolyn, between poverty and, and food insecurity, and then also um, eating disorders and disordered eating. Um, and from like a non-scientific perspective, one of the things that kind of comes up for me is if we look at eating disorders as like a social justice or a food justice issue, we can start to see like connections also between like these bigger systems that organize our lives, you know, things like systemic racism, things like capitalism, things like patriarchy, and how those systems like disproportionately impact people who are experiencing food insecurity. And then those systems also uh, disproportionately tell certain folks what to do with their bodies or how their bodies are allowed to exist in the world, right? So like I know from my own personal experiences with like disordered eating, a lot of that has come out of how I thought I had to pass as white in society or things like white supremacy and capitalism and the ways that I thought my body had to look. Um, and so I think there's like a lot of connections to be made there between like who experiences the most food insecurity and also who is told most often what they should look like or how they should exist out in the world. Um, but I just wanted to add that in because I thought it was like an interesting connection. Um, but back to the, the question was actually asked of me. Um, so looking at the term food security versus like food justice, I think food security is like a really common term. We hear a lot like in mainstream conversations around hunger uh, and food and kind of like our food system. Um, and I think for me, when we talk about food insecurity, it's looking at kind of like, does someone have immediate access to food? Uh, to food that's nutritious and affordable and, and so on and so forth, right? There's kind of like a couple different dimensions of food, food security that are often talked about. Um, but I think that the term food security really looks at kind of like the day-to-day -day, like immediate access issue rather than the broader system itself. So when we talk about food justice, we're looking at like whether or not the entire system is equitable, whether or not the entire system is like impacting each person differently depending on what they look like or who they are. Um, so when we talk about food justice, it's it's thinking about like, how do things like patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy and settler colonialism impact who is accessing food and how they're accessing it? And like, where are those points of oppression and how, we, how do we like dismantle them to create an actually just food system, right? So this idea of like equity and like anti-oppression, I think is really central to food justice. Whereas food security, it's kind of like, it's a good starting point, I think, but it's like, we do need to scale up the conversations to be talking about the system rather than just like the day-to-day, -day, right? So if you're thinking about like a food security response, it would be something like a food bank where someone could go in and immediately access food when they're hungry on that day. But if we're talking about like a food justice solution, it's like, how do we take our cues from communities who are already like doing work to like dismantle these systems and actually build and transform the food system into one that works for everyone rather than one that's like rooted in profit and rooted in like oppressing black and indigenous people. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> uh, and I know there was a second half of it, but I can't recall what it was. Um, yeah, that absolutely uh, further sheds light on, on or helps us understand the concept of, of food justice. Jade, and, uh, and you, you started to touch upon the elements of the second question in terms of um, the intersection of uncertain identities and, um, and food justice or insecurity. And um, I invite you now to add anything else if you'd like to. Sure, yeah. So um, like, like I mentioned earlier, like some folks are more impacted by food insecurity and like food injustice. Um, and we know who those folks are. It's poor folks, it's disabled folks, it's black and indigenous communities. Um, you know, people living in poverty, people working in like gig work jobs, you know, it's folks who are like oppressed by these systems that organize our lives. Uh, we know that black folks in Canada are like more than three and a half times more likely to be food insecure than white folks. Um, you know, Ari mentioned at the beginning how indigenous folks, many communities across the country lack access to even clean drinking water, right? So like, there's some really clear examples of the ways that certain bodies are experiencing um, the kind of, or like, bearing the brunt of this system that's super kind of violent and perpetrates like all of this violence against these bodies. Um, and 
so yeah, I think there's like really clear examples of of how how some people are kind of at the forefront there and most impacted. Uh, there's also, you know, like issues of if we look at like policing within the food system and who experiences that. Um, you know, you look at like going to a grocery store in certain neighborhoods of the city and there's like police or like security guards or baby food is locked up. Um, or we look at like where a lot of uh, folks end up getting kind of like arrested for stealing food when food is a human right in the country, right? And that's like who is getting arrested. Uh, so there's like all these intersections of these like larger systems of violence and they play out every day in our food system and our interactions with food every day. Um, I don't know if anyone wanted to add to that, but, but I hope that kind of started. I just did want to add show. something, one more small piece to that, that I think came out in Amber's story that I think is really important, um, which is this, um, which is really weight stigma, um, because weight stigma really does also um, impact disproportionately um, those who are minoritized and oppressed in our society. Um, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of focus on obesity, you know, being targeted by the medical industry, by public health industries, um, and that very much is also disproportionately targeted towards people who are lower income. Um, and indeed, in one of our most recent studies, we found that weight stigma was more, not only more elevated, but that it does seem to con contribute to eating disorders risk. Um, so, and people who are in lower income populations and people People who are in non-white bodies get a lot of strong messages about how they not, not only should they be white, but they should be thin. Um, and so I think that's another key piece that really comes out from Amber said from talk and I think fits with what Jade is saying, but also um, we now have some research support for. Yeah, for sure. And like, I think there's been a lot of really like great writing too on how weight stigma and fat phobia are rooted in anti-black racism as well. Uh, and so like understanding the connections there and how, you know, poor folks and fat folks and disabled folks and trans and non-binary folks are constantly told that they need to be thin or like take up less space in society. And that's like so rooted in all of these systems. Yeah, thanks for making that connection. Thank you, Jay. Um, you know, it, it, it leads me to think back to another one of those myths that seem to continue to be pervasive and that eating disorders are a matter of individual choice. And we've already heard in this um, discussion so far how the environmental factors at a, at a more local level can have an impact. And then on you know, pretty much every level of uh, society that, that impacts individuals um, and, the, and the larger systems have uh, play a very significant role in, in the development and maintenance of, of eating disorders. Um, if, uh, and, and Jade, I know that you identify as a, a food justice advocate um, and you work at FoodShare, which is a very innovative organization. And Rosie, so if we can turn to you, I know that you're active uh, in that way as well. Um, but as a clinical dietitian, um, I'm wondering if you could share um, how you mesh uh, conversations around food justice with the, the clinical work you do with, with individual um, clients that you might serve. And, again, invite you to, to start with a brief introduction of yourself. Sure, um, so great to be here with you all. And I've just been listening. I have been taking my notes. Like this is just really exciting to be in this space and to hear from all of you amazing panelists. Um, and I'm connected to FoodShare as well, like Jade. I'm also, I'm a board member. Um, and I had the pri privilege of actually being an intern there at one point and really getting to be part of such an innovative and amazing organization doing such great work. Um, so um, like you mentioned, John, I am a registered dietitian. I um, always, you know, been super passionate about systems and looking at systemic issues to health, sy systemic issues to health issues, essentially, because of my own lived experiences. And thank you, Amber, for sharing um, your experiences, because it really was something that I could resonate with. Um, and it, that so food insecurity was really what pushed me to become a dietitian, because I was thinking, you know, food insecurity does impact health. And where's the conversation around that? I just found that there was a lot of band-aid solutions, what I would call like food banks and emergency food, but not really addressing the root issues, like what Jade was talking about. And um, that's just a bit about me. And right now I do a lot of work around educating other dietitians and those who work in food and nutrition around systemic issues. So whether it's um, health equity, food justice, looking at cultural competency and diversity, but really trying to play a role in changing the way that we do our clinical work. 
because all of those systems are super important. And unfortunately, I don't think that there's enough of that recognition or work to dismantle them. So that's what I'm doing now. But in the past, so going back to that question, um, so currently I don't actually work with individuals, but um, previously, um, and the, the question is really interesting to me because it says, how do I mesh food justice um, in those spaces? And for me, the, really it was like, how don't I do that? Because I see it so clearly, right? And that's literally why I went into this space. But um, for me, everything is rooted in systems. And even when I'm interacting with people on the individual level, it, I can see that. So in the past, I worked predominantly with racialized women, many who were um, low income, uh, newcomers, refugees, um, you know, experiencing a lot of challenges. Um, and for me, it was just, it was a difficult working environment for many reasons, just because, you know, you see your clients with so many challenges and unfortunately it's not because of their health behaviors, right? Like health behaviors play such a huge role, of course, but these are systemic issues that they're experiencing. Um, so for me, one thing that I would regularly do is, you know, make space and, you know, address intersectionality. And I think that's what we've been talking a lot about today, like identifying the different layers of someone's identity and making space for those conversations in the room. I think that's something that we can all do as, you know, clinicians just to recognize that, you know, we may be the experts of um, you know, nutrition and even that, you know, it's constantly evolving, but recognizing that people are experts in their own lives and making space from that. So, Although that is not necessarily a tangible thing that I would do, it is something that is really powerful. And I think just identifying the different power dynamics that exist, the different um, layers of our identity that are in the room is something that I did often. And that definitely helped me build rapport with my clientele. Um, and aside from that, really, it was me a seeing as a health pr practitioner, what could I do? So whether it was, was um, you know, writing, uh, letters to, to different organizations or participating in different movements or advocacy. You know, we are limited based on what we can do based on what we where we work. So I do recognize that. But finding ways to champion different initiatives from where I worked um, or even where depending on me going to different events just to, to bring in that perspective. But I just was able to find ways, to, you know, to navigate the system as much as I could as a health professional but to really center the experiences of my clients. Um, so those are some things that I, I did when I was seeing clients one-on-one, -on -one, but honestly, just making that space and making it known that, you know, I recognize that, or I have certain privileges in this room, but um, I recognize the different intersections of your life is something that was really powerful. Rosie, thanks for sharing that. And uh, Carolyn mentioned off the top, the reaction she received from from her peers when she started to talk about the, the research interests that she had. Um, I'm aware that, that you've been doing education work with other dietitians. What kind of um, reaction or, or feedback have you gotten from folks that, that you've really tried to impress upon the importance of, of exploring these types of issues? And have you had any opportunity to go beyond sort of the dietitian um, profession and, and uh, able to educate folks in other professions that uh, provide healthcare? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, hmm, what's the type of response? Well, I would say I do have a really, really supportive community of dietitians who, who know that, and also not just dietitians, I would also say like social workers, therapists, health coaches, nutritionists, those who work in food, um, that they know there's an issue, but often they just don't know what to do. And that's something that I had to wrap my head around because I'm thinking like, this is obvious to, to me, right? I could see all these issues, but I had to kind of take a step back and recognize, you know, like if you, if you don't have these lived experiences, it is challenging for you to be aware. It's not necessarily an excuse for it, but I can be empathetic and understanding in that way. Um, so I do have a strong community that's being created that, you know, folks are either, you know, new to this, like everything that was happening last summer around Black Lives Matter, you know, people started to, wake up essentially and see what's what's happening so there's a lot of people there um and they're looking for support and then i would say there's the performative piece where you know people 
are, you know, saying that this is an issue, but not doing anything about it. Um, so I would say that both exist. Um, or, you know, there's folks who don't think this is a real issue. Anyways, like, you know, you just keep on with your day. So I would say that for me, I definitely focus on those who want to make change. And that's how I protect my own energy in this space, because it can be quite draining. Um, and I do focus on those who actually want to do something. Um, yeah. I don't know if I answered the question. I feel like I forgot half of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, that's very illuminating, and so thank you for that, Rosie. Um, I'm a little conscious of time, and I know that there were a lot of other things you wanted to discuss. Um, so maybe I'll pose one more question and ask each of you to, to touch upon it. Um, and, and the question is um, either to talk a little bit about um, should uh, treatment programs and folks offering support to people with eating disorders um, make a point of including concepts of food justice or food scarcity um, or insecurity um, in those programs, um, and any other messages that you would like to share with, with folks providing uh, support for people with uh, eating disorders. So, Kellen, I see you're- I'm Yeah, I'll, I'll, ju I'll jump in here and actually also respond simultaneously to a, to a question that was raised by one of the people who's watching this about um, their own treatment that people were not necessarily sensitive as providers to um, people who had food insecurity in terms of meal planning. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that I um, made a point when I do this, when I talk about this stuff to raise that eating disorder stereotype, because I think that stereotype is part of what led providers to be so blind to who was coming in their doors and not asking these questions. Um, and so I get asked a lot by clinicians, like, what can we do? And the first thing I say is to do what, you know, other people on this panel are arguing for, which is make sure you understand who is there. Um, if you don't ask people about their experiences, then you don't know. Um, people don't necessarily walk in and say, by the way, I'm impoverished and I can't afford food. There's a lot of shame around that. Um, and so one of the first things is really making sure you understand, can people afford meal plans? Can people afford what's in front of you? And I know a number of clinics that since we did, started doing this work and started really um, getting the message out, and I will say the eating disorders field has been very responsive, in my opinion, once we started getting this out. They were perplexed at first, but then they were responsive um, and started, I've had a number of clinics contact me and say, you know, once we started asking about food insecurity, we discovered a whole swath of our patients were food insecure and we didn't realize that. And so then they started tailoring uh, um, treatment plans and they started recognizing that they needed to provide more supplement to people um, if they didn't have the money to fulfill their meal plan and really talk through this. Um, there's some really great research out there too by um, looking at the intersection of psychotherapy and poverty that I think would have a lot to teach those of us who are therapists. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is having spent some time in the food justice world, at least where I've been, the people I've talked to, they're very, very focused on obesity um, and trying to get them to recognize the potentially like weight stigmatizing messages that are being put out there. Um, and then to realize that eating disorders can be a genuine problem with food insecurity. Um, those are just my few comments. I'm sure the other panelists have way more interesting things to say, so I'll be quiet. Oh, thank you for your response, Carol. Um... Amber, is there any messages that you'd like to share? Sure, and I totally agree with everything that Carolyn said, and I can't speak to the food justice piece because I'm not a minority, so don't have those experiences, but I, I definitely agree with um, like people that are treating um, people with eating disorders or clinicians. Like, obviously, I think it's an important piece to make sure that those people have access to food because if there's no abundance of food, um, they're going to remain in that sort of stuck in that feast famine sort of mentality or that scarcity mindset, which make which makes it really difficult to like, um, you know, have no food rules when you have no food like that it's just it doesn't work so you know dealing with the root issue or getting to the root issue and dealing with that first I think is is really important but I also wanted to touch on the the weight stigma piece like one thing that I've really um dealt with um is is weight bias in the medical field and dealing with medical professionals um, who have assumptions about 
um, you based on your size. And that's been a real struggle because I've had doctors make all kinds of assumptions about my health when I was in a smaller body and um, I was extremely unhealthy. Um, and then I've also had them make assumptions when I've been in a larger body and I'm at probably more healthy than I've ever been, but because I am, you know, in a larger body, there's assumptions there. And so any kind of strategies for people that have eating disorders to deal with those medical professionals and that weight bias is, I think, really key. And there's absolutely a responsibility on the, on the professions to um, increase the education and awareness around those things as well. So thank you for sharing that. Jade, do you want to share anything? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, so I come from a, a social work background um, and I always found that often like in some spaces, clinical settings um, can be really like pathologizing, which like, and it kind of like shrinks everything down to the individual level and to like people's individual experiences and really like puts the burden on them. And it's like, you know, all obviously all a larger part of like the neoliberal capital agenda. Uh, but I would say like, I think, yeah, like integrating food justice and like food justice learning and, and understandings into programming like this can make it, can take it out of that kind of like individual setting and make it like a collective experience. Like I think that um, going into treatment for eating disorders can be really isolating and like the experience of eating disorders can be really isolating, right? And so like, where can we build connection and, and, and the sense of like collectivity? And I think it's by like politicizing it and by making those connections to systems and understanding like where those those points of connection are because they do exist. And, and instead of thinking about like, you know, like the person as a fitting into a certain like pathology box is thinking about like, how do we like move forward together towards like liberation, right? Like there's so many um, connections to be made between things like black liberation and indigenous sovereignty and like bodily autonomy. And like, you know, all of these things are connected and they're all about autonomy and like liberation really, right? So it's like, I think by integrating like food justice learning and food justice understanding and principles into these spaces that are like a bit more clinical, we can, move out of that space that's really pathologizing and like individualistic. Thank you for that, Jade. Um, and, and Rosie, I, I think you've touched on, you know, advice for other service providers, but um, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, so I definitely, um, as a service provider, I definitely think we need food justice integrated into our education, definitely. And that's sort of why I'm starting to do the work that I'm doing, because it's it wasn't happening by like larger institutions. Um, and I think going back to what Jade was saying, like liberation, and also just even looking at the power of imagination and thinking about what can things look like in you know, a better, just world, I think practitioners, and I can speak maybe for dietitians. I think there's a lot of perfectionism that exists in our space. And that does cause a lot of harm, like perfectionism, um, exceptionalism, things like that. And these are things that don't allow us to, you know, ask questions, to learn from people with lived experiences, to actually make change. And I think we really need to move away from that to really, um, to, to serve our clients and the larger system to the best of our abilities. So I would definitely say um, we need to make more room for food justice conversations and even being integrated into our education and training. And not, and I wanna emphasize like not just an addition, but really the foundation of our work. Cause often these are things that are like, a, you know, like a nice add on, um, but it has to really be moved to the foundation of what we're taught and how we practice. Thank you. And, and I would imagine that uh, those kinds of discussions and that kind of learning would have just residual benefits in all, a lot of different areas, yeah, eating disorders in particular. And, and uh, really, when you think about the um, social work or psychotherapy or, or supports in the mental health space, that, that uh, there's just a myriad of benefits that could be derived. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's 12.52, and um, so I, I apologize for going a little over time in, in terms of this discussion. Um, and I confess that I haven't been monitoring questions in the chat. Um, so maybe if I could ask uh, Ari, um, do we have time for one or two questions? Yeah, no, I think we do. I, 
Caitlin, have you seen anything specific? Like, I think first thing I'll say, I'm loving the chat. I really appreciate a lot of the feedback that's in here and a lot of the points that they're making. And for our panelists, because you've been maybe so busy um, giving us your awesome perspectives, if you haven't had a chance to look at the chat, there's a lot of um, kudos and positive words in here for you too. Um, I don't see anything specifically on my end that is like a direct question to a panelist other than the one that Carolyn um, nicely worked into her answer. Caitlin, do you have any on your end that you've seen? No, I don't. So if anyone um, does have specific questions for all panelists or for an individual panelist, feel free to add them to the chat. We won't have time to go through everything, of course, um, but you can take a moment to do that. Um, in the meantime, while folks think of questions, um, Carolyn, someone is asking um, how to access uh, your studies and publications. So they are they are published, um, and uh, some of them may be behind um, paywalls because my research that I've done in this area hasn't been funded, so I couldn't afford to put a lot of it in open access journals. So um, you can uh, you can Google if you Google my name um, on Google Scholar and say Carolyn Becker. Um, the other name to put in there is Keisha Middlemass, who is my partner in crime, and she's a fabulous professor at Howard University. I'm going to make sure a shout out to her. Um, if you find that any of you are paywalled and you can't get to them, just email me. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I pop up really fast if you Google me. So um, I'm at Trinity University and my um, email is really easy to find. So if you can't get them, I'm happy to send you copies of them personally, um, but a lot of them should be available. And one question that I feel like I can add on to that, because I feel like the audience is maybe curious um, and I'll name for the panelists that we can always we send out an email to the to the all the attendees afterwards with this, but if any of you have any learnings that you found like books or articles or resources where you feel like you've been able to learn is there anything you want to shout out or amplify um, with this time for Jade Rosie and Amber. Um, I think someone already put it in the chat but fearing the black body by spring strings amazing amazing also hunger by Roxane Gay anything by Roxane Gay is amazing. Um, and then I'll also share in the chat food chair recently like rewrote our body liberation and fat acceptance statement. Um, and that kind of links in weight stigma, fat phobia, and then like broader systems of oppression. So I will share that for folks to kind of check that out and understand where those ties are between food justice um, and, you know, body liberation. Um, and I will just quickly, um, so last year, myself along with two other dietitians co-founded a group called Dietitians for Food Justice. So we're really trying to champion food justice work in di the dietetic space. So definitely we have an Instagram account, so you can learn from us there. And then I also, as I mentioned, I did create a resource for dietitians and other nutrition professionals on culture, equity, diversity, and race in dietetics. Um, so if you follow me even on social media as well, I talk a lot about that. And once it's available, you can register if you would like. As far as um, for those who may be in recovery, um, a couple of podcasts that I have been um, listening to, one of them is called Food Psych by Christy Harrison. Um, that one's been really helpful. And another one is by um, Kate Noel called Take the Cake, another really good um, podcast that I've been listening to. Okay, so um, while we didn't get to all of the, the discussion points that we had planned, um, I'm extremely grateful for the wonderful discussion that has taken place. Um, I think that um, you know, many of the, the thoughts and, and ideas that were shared um, hopefully you know, triggered more questions um, and, uh, and folks can, can leave this event and this discussion with uh, lots of um, things to, to think about, questions to ask, um, and further discussions maybe to have within your own networks and, and uh, in your places of work and, and your ongoing, uh, your ongoing practice. Um, is there someone with their hand up? Yeah, so I do see we have a question. Unfortunately, we are, um, we have run out of time very quickly. And I know there were a few questions that were posed in the chat. Um, so what I would recommend, I know not all of the panelists will of course be in attendance, but we do have um, part two
of our eating disorders and food insecurity kind of mini series happening next week. We'll put the registration link in the chat. It will look very, very different from today as it is a cooking demonstration with one of our awesome Sheena's Place group facilitators. Um, but there may be some questions that came up today that you can bring to that um, next week. Um, and if you have questions you know, specifically for panelists, I know some folks have shared their social media um, and information there. Um, so I'll invite you to get in touch if appropriate um, in that way. Um, the last thing I will mention is that we also have an evaluation or a feedback form that's anonymous that uh, we will put in the chat. You will also get an email with this from Eventbrite um, right at one o'clock. And so we really, really um, would love to hear your feedback, um, positive, constructive, anything, as this will really help us with future panels and future outreach initiatives. Um, Ari, do you have anything to add? No, I just, again, want to comment in the chat. Um... If for those for, the, for our panelists to really take a moment to look at the chat because I feel like it's there's a lot of really positive things in there and um, just thank the panelists on behalf of Netic on for all the work that you've done. Um, we really appreciate the conversation today and we really appreciate the many folks who are able to take their time to attend. Um, so thank you. <laughs>